Hello, this video focuses on examination of the hand and wrist with a particular reference to arthritis, lumps, dupatrons, carpal tunnel and trigger finger. Assessment of the hand and wrist definitely starts with a history. There are a number of joints, tendons, ligaments, arteries, nerves, skin, etc. Uh, to examine and it's useful to come to a rapid idea as to exactly which bit one needs to focus one's attention on. So a history of the symptoms in terms of pain uh, which may be related to an injury, in terms of neurological symptoms, possibly vascular symptoms, colour changes, uh, discomfort in the cold etc. is extremely important. A history of the onset is crucial did it come on after an injury? Did it come on slowly? Are the symptoms related to work? Are they related to uh, particular recreational activities or nocturnal, for example? Important to know what worsens them and what relieves them. Examination of the hands uh, themselves. It's important to have the forearms and preferably the, the arms exposed as well to get an assessment of the general muscle bulk, uh, skin texture, etc. of the whole upper limb. Uh, just occasionally lumps and bumps can be hidden under the clothing. So firstly one inspects the forearm, the wrist and the dorsum of the hand looking for skin changes, scars of previous injuries or surgery, looking for lumps, looking for deformity of the joints such as uh, inflammation around the metacarpal phalangeal joints from an inflammatory arthritis or shouldering at the base of the thumb related to trapezium metacarpal joint arthritis. Osteoarthritis is, is usually shown by either Bouchard's nodes, which are lumps at the metacarpal phalangeal joints, sorry, at the proximal phalangeal joints, or Hebbidens nodes, often pairs of lumps around the dorsum of the distal interphalangeal joints. A mucous cyst may overlie these and require treatment. Dupatron's disease somebody is sometimes is associated with Garrod's pads which are cutaneous lumps on the dorsum of the proximal interphalangeal joints. Rheumatoid disease also has a number of hand signs and may present with on the drift of the digits and deformities such as swan neck or boutonnier. Swan neck deformity, which is with hyperextension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint may be traumatic with a mallet injury, i.e. an avulsion of the um, terminal slip of the extensor apparatus. The opposite is a boutonnier deformity with flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension of the distal interphalangeal joint. This may be related to an arthritis or sometimes a traumatic injury of the central slip of the extensor apparatus. Turning the hands over, we can examine the palmar side. Here again we're looking at the forearm bulk, we're looking at the bulk of the thin remnants and the hypothene remnants which may be reduced in arthritis, particularly the base of the thumb, or in neurological conditions such as carpal tunnel syndrome or cubital tunnel syndrome for the hypothenar eminence. We're also looking at the general posture of the hands. If the flexor extensor balance is normal, then there is a cascade of the digits with the index finger lying slightly more extended than the little finger and the others in between. Dupatron's disease is usually quite obvious in the palm with cords perhaps to the digits potentially causing a contracture. There may be an individual contracture of the PIPJ on occasion with the palm not affected. We would also be looking for palmar pits or palmar nodules in Dupatron's disease. Risk ganglions usually occur at this level on the volar aspect and they usually underlie the radial artery lying on the front of this scapulunate ligament. More commonly, they're on the dorsum, here again overlying the scapulunate interval. 
lumps and bumps in other places and not always ganglions and I think it's important to transilluminate any lump that's found because if it does not transmit light it's probably not a ganglion. In older patients there may be a lump over the dorsum of the scapulunate area here which is usually soft in nature may feel slightly lobulated. Uh, this may go with some thickening of the wrist and is usually indicative of a previous injury, maybe many years ago and forgotten, maybe work-related, uh, and is usually related to either a chronic scaphoid non-union advanced collapse arthritis of the wrist or scaphoid advanced collapse arthritis of the wrist and is surprisingly common. So, after visually inspecting the hands, we can start to look at movement. So if we ask our subject to supinate the hands, we can look at full roll-up, and we can assess that all the joints move normally and symmetrically and full extension. Again, they come out uh, smoothly and without any catches indicative of a trigger finger. We can look at abduction and adduction, indicating that the ulnar nerve is working and finger crossing is a rapid ulnar nerve motor check. Similarly, we can see that the thumbs abduct. There's good contraction of the abductor pollicis brevis muscle here and good power in abduction. This indicates that the median motor branch is working. And we can also see that there's good motion at the trapezium metacarpal joint, indicating that there's no trapezium metacarpal joint arthritis. When we come to the wrist, examination of the wrist is best done with the elbows flexed and the hands facing the patient. This is the only way to look at the dorsum of the hand in the anatomical position. Here we could clearly see dorsal ganglia. We could see any other swellings around the wrist. And we can also palpate the dorsum of the wrist. So on this side here, we have the um, ulnar head. And if we come across here, the distal radial ulnar joint. Moving further across on the dorsum of the radius, there's a nodule here which is the listus tubercle. And further on to this side, the, scapho uh, the styloid of the radius. Just distal to the listus tubercle, there's a soft spot and this is the scapholunate interval. This may be tender if there's been a scapholunate ligament injury. The scaphoid tubercle itself is palpable on the volar side of the wrist if we find the radial pulsation find the next tendon, to the next tendon to the ulnar side of that and follow that distally to the wrist crease. There's a lump of bone there which comes and goes. It tends to disappear in ulnar deviation and is more prominent in radial deviation. This is the distal tubercle of the scaphoid bone and pressing on this will cause discomfort in either scapholunate injuries or scaphoid fractures. Movement of the wrist uh, is really in the flexion extension direction, so full flexion, full extension, and up to neutral. Ulnar and radial deviation, so bring the little fingers together and towards the thumbs is ulnar deviation and radial deviation. And then the whole forearm supinates and pronates, and that should be symmetrical between the two. If the patient appears to be complaining of triggering, not only may it be possible to demonstrate the classical triggering of the digit, but sometimes this doesn't occur during the day, but occurs more during the morning or night occasionally. The pathology is at the level of the palmar crease here, and so putting an examining finger over there and asking the patient to actively flex and extend the digit uh, would lead one to feel clicking and a palpable tendon nodule. If the patient is complaining of a horseshoe pain around the base of the thumb, with shouldering of the trapezium metacarpal joint, there's usually arthritis at the base of the thumb. Direct pressure over the trapezium metacarpal joint may be painful, but certainly pressure over the joint with axial compression and a rotatory movement can bring on crepitus and discomfort, confirming the diagnosis. 
Occasionally, patients have arthritis further down at the STT joint, and that can be diagnosed by placing the patient into this position, going over into ulnar deviation whilst holding the hand and putting actual pressure on and moving the hand backwards and forwards. This is usually not painful but placing the hand into radial deviation and doing the same thing may be more uncomfortable if there's STT arthritis. If the patient is complaining of paresthesias, particularly nocturnally on the radial digits of the hand, there may be carpal tunnel syndrome. Tunnell's test is quite specific for this, but less sensitive than phalans or an augmented phalans and is done by tapping over the interval between the flex carpa radialis tendon and the palmas longus in the midline of the wrist between the theno and hypothenar eminences, like this, short sharp taps. This may give paresthesias into the central digits. There are many ways of provoking carpal tunnel syndrome. I normally do an augmented phalans test with pressure over the carpal tunnel, which is in between the theno and hypothenar eminences placing the wrist into full flexion and applying a little pressure over the carpal tunnel. This should reproduce symptoms in the median nerve distribution within 30 seconds. Uh, they may not be as severe as the patient complains of at night, but they should be of the same nature. Ulnar nerve symptoms <coughs> are usually experienced into the little and ring fingers uh, and may come from the elbow most commonly and rarely from the uh, area of Guillaume's canal. The first motor sign is wasting of the first dorsal introsius muscle and palpating this and comparing it to the other is useful. There may also be guttering in between the metacarpals and wasting of the hypothenar eminence which can be palpated on both sides to compare. A Tunnell's test over the ulnar nerve at the elbow may be positive, although sometimes this is positive in normality as well. It's also worth just checking for a subluxing nerve with the examining finger over the mesial epicondyle to see if it jumps out of its groove. That makes people more prone to cubital tunnel syndrome. <coughs> Sensory testing is of the little finger versus the index finger. And there are a couple of special motor tests, and in particular, Froment's test. If the patient puts their hands together, gives you two thumbs ups, a piece of paper, clamp down. I actually find it better if you tell the patient it's a five pound note. They tend to wrestle harder and get them to pull it away from you. The positive test is if the thumb on one side flexes at the interphalangeal joint. Another test is the card test. So if you get the patient to make a pistol, Place the paper in between the fingers and pull away. They should maintain a good grip just between the fingers on that paper. Thank you.